Ladies and gentlemen, let us all stand to welcome the Vice President of the Republic of Seychelles, Mr. Ahmed Afif. Vice President, Mr. Ahmed Afif. Speaker of uh, the National Assembly, Mr. Roger Mancien. Former President, uh, Mr. Danny Faure. Designated Minister, Mr. Jean-François Ferrari. Ministers. Director General of the Seychelles Intelligence Service. Members of the National Assembly, Secretary of State, Deputy Governors of the Central Bank of Seychelles, our guest speaker, former Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick uh, Joroge, board members and staff of the Central Bank of Seychelles, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed, good evening. I would also like to welcome members of the public uh, who are joining us virtually for the event which is being live streamed on YouTube and Facebook. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to the Central Bank's lecture to commemorate the 45th anniversary since the establishment of the Seychelles Monetary Authority in 1978. The theme chosen for this year is navigating the, evo the evolving landscape of central banking, which will be the focus of the lecture from our distinguished guest speaker. During the evening, we will also witness the launching of the Central Bank's strategic plan that will guide the bank's action over the next five years. As I have highlighted, the Central Bank is celebrating its 45th anniversary today. To kickstart the event, it gives me great pleasure to launch the 45th anniversary logo that has been designed by our own Central Bank team to commemorate this milestone. Ladies and gentlemen, let us turn our attention to the screen for the logo reveal. The CBS 45th anniversary logo is designed with a prominent number 45 atop wavy lines. The waves depict the various challenges that the bank has faced 
and the opportunities for growth that the institution has embraced. The CBS logo encapsulated within the number 45 represents the institution. The use of the color gold, other than being part of the corporate CBS colors, also represents success with the varying shades signifying different levels of accomplishment. From economic reform to COVID-19, CBS has been through ups and downs, but yet still, still perseveres. Overall, the logo depicts CBS riding the waves of the constantly evolving economic and financial landscape over the past 45 years. I now invite the first Deputy Governor, Mr. Brian Cometa, on stage to do the honor on, of unveiling a replica of the 45th anniversary logo. Mr. Cometa. Thank you, um, uh, First Deputy Governor. We will now move to the next part of our anniversary lecture, which is the introductory presentation by the First Deputy Governor. Mr. Cometa was appointed as the First Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Seychelles in August uh, 2022. He has had a long-standing career at CBS, having joined the institution in April 2001 as an economist. Before his appointment as the first deputy governor, he was the head of research and statistics, a position held since 2011. Mr. Komita holds a master's of science in international economics, banking, and finance from Cardiff University, Wales, and a bachelor's of science in business economics from the University of East London, UK. May I now invite the first deputy governor to deliver his presentation. Vice President, Mr. Ahmed Afif, Speaker of the National Assembly, Mr. Roger Machen, former President, uh, Mr. Danny Faure, Designated Minister, Minister Francois Ferrari, Director General of the Seychelles International Intelligence Services, Secretary of State, our guest speaker, former Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Jeroge, Board Members, and staff of the Central Bank of Seychelles, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observe, good evening. Before I commence this introductory presentation, I would like to present um, Governor Carolina Bell warmest wishes to our distinguished guests, esteemed partners, and CBS colleagues. The governor could not be present with us this evening as she is out of the country. But being a strong advocate of business continuity, she will be following the proceedings through the, in the live stream. I will now proceed with the introductory presentation. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to the Central Bank's 45th anniversary celebration. 45 years has flown by. And during this time, the institution has gone through many changes, faced numerous challenges, achieved many accomplishments, despite the bank's exterior facade has remained unchanged throughout the years, internally much have evolved compared to the modest beginning at the Seychelles uh, Monetary Authority. Today, we are proud to present this institution and also pay tribute to all the individuals who have contributed towards this to success during the 45 year period. Before we, we unpack the theme for this year's lecture, I would like to take you all on a brief journey of the bank from the humble origin to what it is today. 
The Central Bank of Seychelles had witnessed and underwent transformation alongside the evolution of the country. From a primary sector economy, which focused on the exportation of spices, to a services-oriented economy, predominantly driven by the tourism sector. Over the 45 years, from the time as the Seychelles Monetary Authority established on 1st December 1978, the bank has remained steadfast in delivering its mandate despite the many adversities encountering along the way. The depth of the bank's values was defined even back then in 1978 by the prominent feature of the logo, the Hawksbill turtle, which exhibit key attributes uh, such as strength, stability, long life, high productivity, and the instinctive nature to carefully protect its assets. There are values that the bank aspire to emulate uh, throughout the existence. Hence, the original logo is embedded within the 45th anniversary logo. In addition, as early, um, the f sorry, in addition, as seen earlier, the 45th anniversary logo depicts the 45 years of CBS existence. Over these years, we have been through many ups and downs, but yet we still persevere riding the waves of the constantly evolving economic, um, evolving economic and financial landscape. We will now take a brief walk down memory lane. The central bank that stands today is the culmination of the efforts of many who have ensured that the institution remains robust in its deliverables. Central banking in Seychelles started as far back as in 1935 with the establishment of the Seychelles Currency Board that was similar to other British colonies at the time. Almost 40 years later, the Seychelles Monetary Authority, the SMA, was founded on 1st December 1978 in accordance to the SMA decree, which was enacted on 24th November 1978. In December 2004, the Central Bank of Seychelles Act, which formally bestowed the institution with a high degree of institutional and operational autonomy was enacted. The macroeconomic reforms of 2008 brought about significant changes in central banking as a whole. The CBS Act was revised in 2008 to cater for a change in the exchange rate regime. In November 2008, Seychelles moved from a fixed to a floating exchange rate system. In 2009, further amendments were, were made to the CBS Act. And this included setting the objective of the bank as follows. A, to promote domestic price stability. B, to advise the government on banking, monetary, and financial matters including the monetary implication of proposed fiscal policies, credit policies, or operational of the government to promote, and C, to promote a sound financial system. In 2011, further amendments were made to the CBS Act, and these were mainly setting the primary objective of the bank, which is to promote domestic price stability. In addition, Provision was made to, for the appointment of first and second deputy governors. As we continue the walk down memory lane, in 2014, as entrenched in the National Payment System Act, the NPS, CBS mandate was mandated to regulate and oversee the national payment system. In light with this, the payment system division was created in May of the same year. Its responsibilities was to oversee payment system infrastructures in Seychelles in addition to providing the legal framework 
to promote safety, soundness, and reliability in payment system. The division was, however, restructured in May uh, 2017 into the Financial Inclusion and Market Conduct Division, the F uh, FIMCD. Its, its primary role is to develop and implement strategies for enhancing financial inclusion, market conduct, and consumer protection in Seychelles. In 2016, a financial stability unit was created in January. And it, uh, it was created as a standalone unit. The unit is tasked with identifying financial stability concern and preserving financial stability. The unit was later transferred to the Financial Surveillance Division as part of in an internal restructuring process in May 2017. At the national level, the Financial Stability Committee was established, and this was by order of the President with the aim to promote financial stability. In January 1999, the current interest rate-based framework was adopted with the introduction of a monetary policy rate. This was a transition from the reserve money targeting framework adopted when the country embarked on the macroeconomic reform program in late 2008. Over the years, it became clear that it was necessary to enhance guidance provided to the market on the monetary policy stance to encourage the deepening of the interbank market and ultimately improve the transmission of interest rate. In 2020, to support and allow market players to further develop and promote digital payment uh, platform, a national payment system modernization plan was implemented in August. The plan also aims to address factors that deter the usage and access to digital financial services locally. We all remember the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. The pandemic underscored the importance of business continuity, which is at the core of central banking. In that context, the bank's IT infrastructure, infrastructure provides for the implementation of remote access technology to enable efficient operations and effective collaboration with other stakeholders. In 2021, there was the launching of the Seychelles FinTech strategy in August for banking and payment services. The aim is to help service providers to leverage technological innovation in the financial sector to maximize economic growth. In 2022, there was the enactment of the Financial Consumer Protection Act in May. The law aims to set market standard and deter abusive practices by financial services providers against financial consumers. As we have seen in the previous slides, we experienced three distinct phases in the bank's journey uh, thus far. One, which is the establishment of the central bank and putting the internal structure in place. Second, having the right level of, uh, having the right legal framework. And three, more recently, embracing the, ra the wave of modernization that is happening in the financial world. This leads us to the key focus area over the years. To keep pace with development in, in the wider economy, the bank has always emphasized on the need for capacity development and building the leaders of the future. As mentioned, the bank has also undergone technological um, advances, enhanced interaction with public and media, as well as adopted uh, to evolving mandates. As initiated by Mr. Gimorel, the first governor of the institution, the practice of offering short-term and long-term training opportunities and continuous learning for the staff has persisted throughout the years. Training at the bank is a continuous process and, pro and proves to be useful when implemented in various situations. Capacity development is not only limited to within the institution, but is also carried out in other organizations. Workshop allows for people to learn in an informal setting 
uh, staff from the bank are present to, to share knowledge and simple terms without the usual technical jargon that one may associate with such uh, training. As part of its capacity building initiative, the bank is also investing in creating future leaders that will carry the institution forward through its leadership development program. The, this next generation, generation of central bankers will ensure the effective management of the bank and preserve the core values and integrity of the institution. This is through the empowerment of staff, which are the main asset of the central bank and key to its success. The central bank has evolved in the way it functions in line with the growth of the domestic economy, global market, and central banking community. In 1978, manual processes involved using ledgers and NCR typewriter style accounting machines. A few years later, in the 1980s, tele telex machines were used to send and receive authenticated payment messages. In line in line with rising um, uh, prominence of the internet and computers, accounting softwares were introduced as of 1999. In an effort to facilitate electronic banking processes, the bank embarked on the standardization of checks and launched the, Seychelles, the Central Bank of Seychelles immediate transfer services. Electronic banking processes were further cemented by the launching of the central bank core banking system in, 2020, in 2010. The credit information system, the CIS, was introduced in March 2012 with the aim to allow the collection and exchange of credit and other relevant information among credit granting institutions. In the same year, 2012, in August, there was the launching of the electronic check clearing system, the ECC, to facilitate electronic check clearing processes using electronic check images for same day clearing. In 2012, the Seychelles electronic funds transfer was launched to facilitate electronic transfer of funds between all banks and the Seychelles Credit Union. The system was later upgraded in February 2017. At a regional level, we joined the SADEC um, real-time gross settlement system, the RTGS system, in 2016, which has facilitated cross-border payments. It's in September 23, which is this year, the contract was awarded for the supply and implementation of the central securities deposit and real-time gross settlement system for CBS. This project is being undertaken in the context of the modernization of the national payment system. It aims to provide the necessary impetus to encourage increased usage of digital banking services. To summarize, since 2008, the bank has been gradually transitioning and modernizing its operation in line with the advancement in technology. This has been greatly enhanced by the improvement in telecommunication following the introduction of the submarine fiber optic cable, optic cable in 2012, which has, has allowed for improvement in connectivity. Central bank communication can be interpreted as a form of public good. Information communicated by the bank should be accessible to all. Most central banks around the world would have understood the importance of disseminating information to the public and have implemented a clear communication strategy to do so. Press conferences allow the bank to share information pertaining to policy changes. Uh, this is to the market and the public in general at large through media houses. Moving to a live press conference, press conference format allowed the messages to be relayed as intended rather than in a reduced format, which may often omit key messages. Moreover, questions post posed by the journalist and the responses provided help shed more lights on the topic of discussion.
The mandate of the central bank has evolved over the years. Namely, these include monetary policy, financial stability, reserve management, payment system, banker to the government, AML CFT matters, financial consumer protection, financial education, and bank resolution. In addition, the bank is, is represented in both national and international platform, which lends credence to the importance of the institution. Having, having just looked at the different milestone over the last 45 years, it is time to reflect on what next a few decades may hold for the bank as it continues to remain one of the key focal institution within the economy. Looking ahead, several aspects are expected to remain critical derivable for the central bank. These include, this would continue to include monetary policy, financial stability, financial integrity, deepening the financial system, and financial consumer protection. In addition, climate change consideration are anticipated to become increasingly embedded across numerous deliverables of the bank, as well as providing the necessary support and guidance to players in the financial system. Whilst FinTech has also emerged as a new era, other aspects such as the use of artificial intelligence and digital currencies may also be considered down the line. More interestingly, um, topics that may currently be unheard at, that point in, at this point in time may emerge as a few, in a few decades which reflects the rapidly changing environment. It is without any doubt that the central bank will need to continue adapting to the changing tides uh, of the financial sector as well as the evolving economy. Hence, having reflected on the history of the institution, as we are looking ahead at what may transpire, it is my pleasure to introduce this year's anniversary theme, navigating the evolving landscape of central, bank, central banking. Thank you. Thank you, First Deputy Governor, for this uh, very insightful presentation that has taken us through time, showcasing the evolution of the Central Bank of Seychelles. The evolution of the Central Bank of Seychelles. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure of calling upon our guest speaker and keynote lecturer for the evening, Dr. Patrick Joroge. He served as the ninth governor of the Central Bank of Kenya for a period of eight years, from June 2015 to June 2023. Prior to this, he has had a distinguished 20-year career at the International Monetary Fund and served as advisor to the IMF Deputy Managing Director from December 2012 up until his appointment as governor. He also served as Deputy Division Chief in the IMF's Finance Department from uh, 2006 to 2012 and in other capacities before that. He holds a PhD in Economics from Yale University, a Master's of Arts in Economics, and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Nairobi. Dr. Joroge's professional and research interest lies in fintech and innovation, macroeconomics, monetary policy, international finance, and development economics. He has received several awards and recognitions, including four awards for Africa's Central Bank of the Year. He also received the degree of Doctor of Human Letters, Honoris Causa, of Kenyatta University. Dr. Joroge, you may take the stage to deliver your lecture. Vice President, Mr. Ahmed uh, Afib, 
Speaker of the National Assembly, Mr. Roger Manchien, former President, Mr. Danny Faure, designated minister, Mr. Jean-Francois Ferrari, ministers, Director General of the Seychelles in Intelligence Service, members of the National Assembly, Secretary of State, Governor of the Central Bank of Seychelles, who is uh, with us remotely, uh, Deputy Governors of the Central Bank of Seychelles, board members and staff of the Central Bank of uh, Seychelles, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Good evening. I'm honored to join you uh, for the CBS anniversary lecture 2023. At the outset, let me express my gratitude to Governor Caroline Abel for inviting me to be the speaker at this important lecture. I also congratulate the entire Central Bank of Seychelles family as you celebrate your 45th anniversary, and I welcome your choice of theme for the lecture, Navigating the Evolving Landscape of Central Banking. Like most other countries with a colonial history, the establishment of CBS from its predecessors on January 1, 1983, was closely related to the development of the newly independent nation and the pursuit of its aspirations. Its immediate predecessor, as the uh, Deputy Governor explained to us, um, was the Seychelles Monetary Authority that was established on December 1, 1978, which set off this 45-year journey that we are celebrating today. Actually, a voyage marked, as we also um, as was explained to us, was marked by many challenges, triumphs, and moments of renewal. CBS has dealt with, among other things, large macroeconomic imbalances and vulnerabilities, acute balance of payment crisis, depleted foreign exchange reserves, and public debt crisis, all of which impacted negatively on the lives and livelihoods of the citizens of Seychelles. These were extraordinary shocks. Even by the standards of small open island economies, requiring CBS's vision and diligence to realize the needed economic reforms. Importantly, CBS has, over the years, over this period, evolved in its mission, governance, and operational instruments to become a model central bank delivering price stability and financial system soundness. At end of uh, 2019, ahead of the COVID pandemic, inflation was recorded at 1.7%. The economy was growing at 1.9%. CBS held foreign reserves equivalent to 3.8 months of import. In a liberalized foreign exchange environment, the banking sector was stable with low non-performing loans, and government debt was equivalent to 57.7% of GDP. In all this, the critical role of CBS staff and the leadership of the six CBS governors has to be applauded. As Governor Abel noted in 2013, and I quote, governors differ in charisma, but we possess one thing in common, the resolve to work tirelessly to uphold the ideals of the bank, which are strength, stability, and the instinctive nature to serve and protect the economic interest of the country. Congratulations to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. A key economic driver over the last three decades has been globalization which integrated and opened distant markets to producers across the, across the globe. While the benefits have accrued to many countries, including in Africa, the significant cost to many, um, the significant cost to many economies, such as from premature de 
deindustrialization and the social cost of jobs, um, job losses in the sectors that collapsed has been apparent. With the internet revolution in the 1990s and the widespread use of mobile phones, the power of globalization was placed at the fingertips of citizens almost everywhere. In 2000, mobile phone penetration measured as mobile phone subscription as a percentage of population was at 39% in the United States, 32 in Seychelles, and 0.4% in Kenya. By 2020, 20 years later, the mobile phone penetration in all three countries was over 100%, with the United States recording the lowest at 105%. In turn, this allowed increased access to formal financial services in many sub-Saharan Africa, African countries. In Kenya, for instance, our um, access to, uh, to financial services increased from 26% in 2006 to over 84% in 2021. However, Seychelles has a highly banked population, thankfully, at 94% um, in, uh, two, in 2016. More recently, concerns about the possible breakdown of supply chains and national security have caused some advanced countries to consider reducing their dependency on foreign manufacturers in some key areas, encouraging local solutions, for instance, on shoring or nearshoring of key components, which would result in a more fragmented world. These concerns have reinforced the long-standing concerns about the differentiated impact of globalization and ignited discussions about how to better manage globalization. But having come this far, Seychelles and the rest of the world was about to undergo the greatest of all tests, the COVID-19 pandemic. As the crisis unfolded in April 2020, the IMF projected that global economic activities would decline on a scale not seen since the Great Depression. And those of you that were at the switches when that was happening, um, you do remember those first three months. And uh, basically those were perhaps the most scary three months that most of us have gone through because the sky had fallen on our heads as it were. And in October 2020, the IMF Managing Director summarized the situation as follows. Imagine markets and low-income and fragile states continue to face a, preca a precarious situation. They have weaker health systems. They are highly exposed to the most affected sectors, such as tourism and commodity exports. And they are highly dependent on external financing. Abundant liquidity and low interest rates help many emerging markets to regain access to borrowing, but not a single country in sub-Saharan Africa has issued external debt since March of 2020, end quote. So the impact of the pandemic was significant, far-reaching, and long-lasting across populations, sectors, and countries. Seychelles was hit hard as tourism ground to a halt and the economy contracted drastically. But the authorities' swift response to this, which included measures to address the impact of businesses and households, was highly effective. Nevertheless, many countries are still struggling with the lingering economic and social effects of the pandemic, even as the significant, prog a significant progress made in transforming many economies is acknowledged. As we celebrate the 45th year, 45 year voyage of the CBS, we ask what the next 5, 10, 45 years will bring CBS and the worldwide demand of central banks. What opportunities and risks? And how should central banks face, face them as they unfold? I want to sketch um, the landscape by laying out what I believe to be the key issues 
that will influence the opportunities and risks in the environment that central banks will be operating. And in some sense, I have four colors to paint the landscape or to sketch the landscape. And the first of this is that economies will continue to be buffeted by shocks, large in size and number. So as an open, small island economy, seashells will remain highly vulnerable to external shocks. Further, despite the recent rhetoric of a retreat of globalization, the interconnectedness of economies will increase as self-sufficiency is necessary and inferior outcome. In this environment, prudent macroeconomic policies and building up of buffers such as international reserves while protecting the most vulnerable will remain crucial. However, should central banks alter their course in an effort to increase their effectiveness and the benefits accruing to their citizens? We will examine that later on in the, in the talk. And the second color is that technology will continue to be a significant driver of economic outcomes and opportunities. So technology. The question then is how should central banks react to new technologies and applications? The third color, climate change poses an existential crisis for the entire world and requires urgent and determined actions. How should central banks support climate action? And the fourth color, central banks are increasingly facing pressure from pressures from the political class and a segment of the private sector challenging their long-standing practices and methods. So how will central banks remain focused on their mandates, given these tendencies and incentives for others to encroach on central banks' mandates? Well, the important role played so far by central banks around the world cannot be overemphasized. A tranquil future, where they continue along their current strategies is improbable. They will need to adapt to the demands of the evolving landscape in order to maximize their own effectiveness. In the remainder of this address, I'll address I will outline six broad themes to help central banks face the opportunities and risks that will arise in the context um, that I've already outlined. So the first of these themes, there will always be a need for central banks with core responsibility for price stability and financial stability. But how they, op uh, how, but how they, uh, their operations will, but, but how they do this, their operations will need to, uh, to be updated. In the context of the rapidly evolving economic environment, significant economic shocks, structural changes to the economy, and widespread adoption of new technologies, central banks cannot be content with their current practices and level of effectiveness and have to adapt uh, continuously. The danger is in falling behind with respect to the effectiveness of monetary policy, particularly concerning the tools for policy formulation the implementation infrastructure, and the transmission of policy decisions. In this regard, the recent record of leading central banks, particularly the US Fed, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England, has been disappointing as inflation persisted at multi-decade high levels, far from their target of 2%. This disappointing record has generated a backlash by politicians and the general public, which has in part precipitated the recently announced review of the Bank of England's performance. Additionally, central banks must remain vigilant on financial stability concerns, which if ignored could result in significant damage to the economy. 
To this end, central banks will need to continuously monitor the risks in the financial system, as well as maintain a strong regulatory and supervisory regime that limits these risks. However, is there a balance to be struck between monetary policy in support of financial stability and macroprudential policies, given that macroprudential policies may also be deployed for this objective, the objective of financial stability? In her Michelle Kamdesu lecture in July 2014, Janet Yellen, who is now the U.S. Treasury Secretary of Treasury, examined this question in the context of the U.S. economy, highlighting the limitations of monetary policy in pursuit of financial stability and the unintended adverse consequences, and ruled out monetary policy as the primary instrument. Mindful of the old adage, um, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Caution against over-reliance on monetary policy is appropriate, and other instruments need to be tailored for diverse objectives. Additional responsibility may also be given to central banks, depending on the uh, specific arrangements in this economy, such as supporting economic growth, financial inclusion, national payments, being banker to bank and advisor to government, and uh, the first deputy governor's presentation um, really presented how things are here in Seychelles. Even as the responsibilities in uh, areas of overlap with other regulators. Um, such as concerning combating money laundering and terrorism financing um, and consumer protection, all that will, will also need to be delineated. Nevertheless, the assessment of a central bank's performance will, ne will necessarily begin from its record on the core responsibilities. The importance of the central bank's attention to price and financial stability cannot therefore be overemphasized. So yes, there will be those concerns, but uh, priority from the central bank's perspective has to be price stability and indeed financial stability as well. The second thing, to strengthen decision making and the effectiveness of the operations, central banks will need more accurate and timely data and improvements in their data systems. It is recognized that the timely sorry it is recognized that the timely availability of good quality data facilitates the design and implementation of sound economic policy strengthens the credibility of economic management and bolsters the role of market participants and other invest investors we do have bankers in the room they do understand this very well advances in IT however uh, has now made possible the efficient collection, storage, and analysis of disparate data generated from many electronic platforms. Utilizing these improvements in data handling would allow a central bank to use available data to drive insight, facilitate efficient oversight, and inform well-supported policy decisions. The starting point of this transformation would be a clear link of implementing data-centric decision-making. And as an aside, um, I all, I'm struck as an economist, uh, we generally have been working with, uh, when you say the data is frequent, you generally say, okay, weekly data. Yeah, so, and uh, there's nothing worse than looking, you know, looking at something uh, you are going for a week and you have no clue what has happened during that week. So the timeliness of data has to increase and we should go towards almost real, real time. Uh, so near real time data, at least some specific information that uh, uh, can be generated from the systems that we have. So using modern data warehouse systems, the time it takes to prepare standard business reports can be reduced dramatically while also guaranteeing their accuracy and quality. 
This is in contrast to the ubiquitous error-prone spreadsheet-based systems. I think the people in the central, in the uh, research department uh, do understand this very well. Um, the, the problems of Excel, etc. Um, or clunky mainframe processes. Furthermore, the new systems can be integrated with the supervised financial institutions for the collection and analysis of granular data, strengthening enormously the supervision and regulation of the financial sector. Data scientists can then tease out new insights from the assembled data to support better decision making. Data is indeed the new soil. And it's soil because you, you plant something, you pour water on it, and it grows. So you assemble it, and when you're assembling it, you don't quite know what will come out. But within a, you know, a season, you'll know that you'll begin to get mangoes or something else. You know? The third theme, central banks should be at the table to discuss new developments that may have a bearing on central banks' mandates. New requirements and trends will continue to emerge according to the shifting demands of society. Examples of such recent developments include the push to enhance data protection and customer-informed consent. Um, this I'm sure the commercial bankers in the room understand. The, emergency, the emergence of uh, ESG, that is Environmental, Social, and Governance Standards, aimed at embedding sustainability and ethical um, ethical issues in business, and then implementation action in response to climate change. All these are new themes that have come uh, to us, and they are now very much in our on well on our plate. Additionally, technological advances and human ingenuity will continue to present new innovations in products and processes some of which will challenge the traditional approaches of central banks and the financial sector more broadly. Such issues currently include tokenization. There's a lot of discussion about that. Central bank digital currencies and artificial intelligence. As Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England stated recently, the world is changing rapidly it is less hege hegemonic and more multipolar, less analog and more digital, less destructive and more sustainable, less bank and more market, less centralized, less centralized and more dispersed. The old normal of cash, uh, bank-based finance and bank payments, uh, bank payments rails is crumbling. So these developments offer hope for transforming the operations of governments and uh, businesses, as well as citizens' lives and livelihoods. And quoting here from uh, something else uh, that we wrote recently, some of these technologies, such as AI, present significant opportunities to address some of our most pressing problems in the continent. For instance, Despite micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises being the engines of our economies, access to credit remains a key challenge. This, in part, arises from lack of traditional collateral, such as title deeds, used by uh, financial institutions to secure credit facilities. With the proliferation of digital footprints, AI can be used to generate credit histories of SMEs. Their credit histories can then be used to appraise and appropriately price credit for SMEs that would otherwise be excluded from accessing credit, end quote. So the role of central banks in this new world will shift significantly, and the journey is strewn with risks. For instance, these developments present a clear and present danger to financial stability. Nevertheless, central banks should react with alacrity to these developments and staying ahead of the curve. So first, it's imperative that central banks strive continuously to understand how to discharge their core mandates of uh, monetary and financial stability in the changing world. Moreover, central banks 
um, should be ready to explain what matters to them and the society at large and why. A good example of the desired approach is the strong reaction by the authorities here in Seychelles in 2018 to repair the reputation of a jurisdiction with a high risk of uh, money laundering and the potential loss of correspondent banking relationships. And the term then was de-risking. So we were being de-risked, as it were. And, I, and the authorities, I think, did an excellent job in terms of moving quickly um, once they saw that risk. Second, central banks would benefit greatly from collaborating closely with other central banks. Collaboration. And third, central banks, particularly in Africa, should be at the global table to determine the governance of big techs. So the large, even uh, for that matter, Facebook, so um, all these uh, big techs. In our case, we also have others that are like Safaricom, et cetera. But anyway, all those big techs, Visa, et cetera. These large institutions, the big techs, are already an integral part of our daily lives as we transact and make financial transactions. And their dominance will only increase, paraphrasing a well-known remark, fintech is too important to be left to big techs. So as the authorities in the US, the European Union, and China design governance structures for the big techs in their jurisdictions, we must not be left behind. And a balanced and more inclusive dialogue should be sought. Central banks should also be ready to use their convening power and remind innovators what is required of them, especially that technology and innovations should be people-centric. The example I, I would want to give here is, uh, if you remember, and I ask pardon for the people who are in the commercial business, if you remember there was a, some, well, Barclays was uh, changing the way they operate, and now they have changed that and it become APSA. But uh, in the 13 jurisdictions in Africa, no one single jurisdiction could deal with that. And so we as governors uh, that were in those 13 jurisdictions came together and we had a position and we worked together to minimize the risk. And that is how, in effect, the transition to ABSA was, was conducted smoothly and uh, at the same time making sure that those risks that were, um, that were, that we could, that we could see were addressed before the transactions what they, what took place. And then fourth, central banks need to adopt appropriate rules and regulations in support of policies and actions to deal with the climate change crisis. The global situation with respect to climate change remains dire and urgent action is needed. The State of Climate Action 2023 reports that, and I quote, global efforts to limit warming to one and a half degrees centigrade are falling across the board with, res with recent progress made on every indicator except electric passenger car sales so lagging significantly behind the pace and scale that is necessary to address the climate crisis. And getting back on track to reach the 2030 targets will require massive acceleration of efforts and further delays in these commitments would spell doom to our destiny. Concern in Africa the State of uh, Climate in Africa 2020 report indicated that the climate indicators in Africa in 2020 were characterized by extreme weather events, such as floods and drought, increased temperatures, and uh, accelerated the rise in sea levels, with devastating impact on millions of the population. Incidentally, as we all know, um, there is a meeting that is taking place in Dubai, COP, 28, but I think it is important to appreciate whatever happens there, and we really wish our representatives there the best, the matter is really urgent. 
as the Prime Minister of uh, Barbados said in uh, November 2021 at the COP26 in Scotland, and I quote this, two degrees of global warming is a death sentence for island nations and coastal communities. And, we, and it is clear that we may not get 1.5 without drastic actions. So the scaling up of climate action is needed at all sectoral and national levels, and central banks should respond urgently with efforts to mitigate and adapt the, uh, to climate change as both corporate citizens and industry regulators. The ultimate objective is to build a world where all finance is green, a truly sustainable financial system that works for and with the people. Fifth, central banks need to make themselves better understood by the key stakeholders, including the general public. Given their multifaceted role in guiding economic policies, central banks will necessarily be drawn into discussions that issues sorry, into discussion about issues pertaining to the country. However, the current context is one in which central bank practices and tools are being called to question by the political class and the private sector and cannot be ignored. Conflicts between central banks and governments and are inevitable given their different policy preferences. However, politicians in uh, several jurisdictions have recently deviated from established norms and attacked the long-standing independence of their country's central bank. These attacks, some quite public, have pressured central banks to alter their policies in an effort to achieve other, go other government objectives such as growth and employment or government revenue targets. I think there are two good examples of this, and the first is obviously the U.S. Fed, uh, where the former president, well, then he was president in 2019, uh, President Trump at the time, uh, was stated, actually tweeted, um, that the Fed Reserve should, not, uh, should get our interest rates down to zero or else. And uh, obviously, it wasn't a very favorable sort of con conversation with, uh, with the governor at the time. Well, he's still there. Um, and then also more recently, what has happened in Argentina, where the president-elect, uh, the new president, well, he'll be inaugurated, I think, on the 10th. Um, and he, he campaigned on a platform of shutting down the central bank. And, uh, and he has repeated that after his election, that actually, you know, that is not negotiable. We'll see what happens. And uh, I guess there's a lot that can be said about history, but we do not want history to, uh, to really be on the side of, uh, well, we want history to be on the side of the citizens. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the people that would suffer for, from a bad decision are the people that we care the most about. So those are two simple examples, but I think there are others that we could, uh, we could discuss uh, later. These attacks weaken the collaboration between the central bank and other policymakers and foment the public's view of their central bank as disconnected from their immediate economic concerns. Further, the private sector entities in the payments and financial technology fields are pressing to issue new forms of money, largely unregulated virtual currencies, and challenging the national currencies issued by central banks. So to deal with these concerns, the central bank will need to enhance their communication and engagement with their stakeholders. While communication by central banks are predominantly formal and to the markets and professional analysts, this is hardly adequate for the general public. It is apparent that there is a trust deficit by the general public that has to be bridged. Regular formal and informal engagement with key government officials and the political class would also help. 
Central banks will also need to expand their engagement with private sector entities in the virtual currency space for them to better understand the concerns of the central banks. Overall, these communications will strengthen accountability and also improve the effectiveness of monetary policy. There is certainly scope for central banks to learn from each other. And the final theme, the sixth theme, central banks must ensure that their staff are well-skilled and well-supported in a fit-for-purpose organization. And I noticed the first deputy governor's statement about you know, the importance of staff in the central bank. And staff are the most important asset in any organization, and central banks should ensure that they remain performance-driven institutions with the right people, structures, culture, and systems. A high-performance culture is a key enabler in achieving the central bank's overall vision, and a sustained effort will be needed to embed it in the organization. Importantly, staff skills should be kept up to date through a well-crafted training program in keeping with the evolving demands. New hires can also be sought to bring in new competences that are needed urgently. And these are like data analysts, data scientists, cyber and IT experts. There is a significant scope for collaboration with other central banks and global partners in this area, of course. So, dear colleagues, friends, have outlined what I see as the main elements that will define the landscape for central banks in the period ahead and the ways to maximize their own effectiveness. The future is uncertain, but there will be opportunities and also risks. But time is of the essence, and in the words of a Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So I want to conclude by noting that the voyage we are embarking on requires good seamanship, but also hope and courage. Central bankers will certainly not allow being defined by the difficulties that they will face, but rather by our resilience in opposing them while embracing the future with hope and courage. One of the joys and privileges that I have uh, that I had serving at the helm of the Central Bank of Kenya was interacting regularly uh, with athletes. I learned so much from them about discipline, resilience in the face of difficulties, and relentless execution. There are many books and methods of, uh, for those that wishing to train for a marathon. And by the way, I was told yesterday about your marathon that takes place... Uh, I guess it's said in November, but I'm not sure now when. Um, I'm not going to wait for that. <laughs> anyway, so there are many books about uh, training for the marathon. And success involves daily activity with small, at times imperceptible changes. But sticking to a plan and working with others is what matters most. No wonder Eliud Kipchoge, the greatest marathon of all time, emphasizes discipline and teamwork. And I quote, two things is said. Only the disciplined ones in life are free. And then, you cannot train alone and expect fast time. But every central banker is in this all the way. Roger Bannister, the first person to run a four-minute mile, said it best, and I quote. However ordinary each of us may seem, we are all in some ways special and can do things that are extraordinary, perhaps until then even thought impossible. Just because they say it is impossible doesn't mean you cannot do it. Thank you very much and congratulations once again to the CBS on the anniversary.
Thank you, Dr. Juroge, for sharing uh, your knowledge and experience through this very informative presentation. May I now invite you to take the seat on the stage. First Deputy Governor, may I invite you to join Dr. Joroge on stage as well as we open the floor to interventions. I would also like to invite Ms. Ragvinaidu to join us on stage to moderate the Q&A session. Ms. Naidu is a senior economist in the Research and Statistics Division at the Central Bank of Seychelles. She holds a Master's of Science in Economics Policy from University College London and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the Uni University of Nottingham. Aside from her official duties, Ms. Naidu is an ardent advocate of financial literacy for the youth. Ms. Naidu? Technical issues, apologies. Thank you, Jude, for having steered the event with such finesse. Before I open the floor to questions and comments, I would like to pick out a few pertinent points that were raised by our distinguished guests. Thank you once again, Dr. Jeroge, for weaving an insightful narrative of what can be expected for central banking in the years to come. I found it interesting that you said central banks should not expect a tranquil future, especially if the status quo is maintained. This could be interpreted in two ways. On one hand, it's a stark warning for central banks that we need to adapt to new exigencies, perhaps at an even faster pace when compared to our peers from decades ago. On the other hand, while it does sound scary for us central bankers today, these emerging areas may lead to more innovative solutions as well, which at the same time is very exciting and may keep us on our toes. First Deputy Governor, your presentation expertly portrayed the journey of central bank thus far. Indeed, looking back at the evolution from a monetary authority to a central bank, technological advancements, organizational changes, and evolving mandates shows how much has been achieved over the past 45 years. It was apparent that the achievements of the bank on both the national and international levels lend credence to the importance of the institution, exactly as FDG highlighted, notwithstanding the size of our economy. Thus, the legacy of the staff, both past and present, was evident. After all, as mentioned, the institution that stands today is a culmination of the efforts of many people. So moving on to the questions part, if I could start. Dr. Jeroge, your intervention highlighted that numerous mandates are to be expected for a central bank going forward. CBS is a small central bank that has to discharge the same functions as a large central bank. How do we prioritize concurrent mandates whilst also taking on new challenges? Thank you very much, Ragvi, the uh, yeah, very insightful question. Um, you are right, CBS is a small central bank. Uh, in many ways, and it will do the same, it will exercise the same functions as, say, the Fed or ECB uh, or the Bank of England, despite its size. So I think uh, prioritizing is important, but also to understand um, how to become more effective. So prioritization and effectiveness in everything. So prioritization, in, a, in some sense, has to be uh, directed by you know the greatest risk, and uh, I think the first of this is macro stability. If we don't have macro stability, nothing else matters. So macro stability in terms of, uh, for instance, inflation, the the first uh, priorities or the first uh, uh, mandates of the central bank, inflation or price stability as we call it, um, or financial stability as well. But also, in some sense, also building buffers. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, foreign exchange, reserves, etc., all that will help um, uh, maintain stability. 
Then I think the other one which is important now is this thing of sustainability. When we think about climate change, that is a big risk. It's a, it's a big risk for all of us. Now, the Central Bank of, uh, um, of uh, Seashells, uh, we could actually say, well, okay, it doesn't uh, control that much uh, institutions that are polluting, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think we understand that, but nevertheless, precisely because of the huge risk that climate change poses to seashells and all the other and the and the world at large this has to be an important uh, element in terms of uh, what the central bank will be doing then there's all these uh, questions if you may about uh, benefit working with the banking sector uh, to make use of uh, already uh, let's say existing um, uh, trends, etc. For for instance, we talked a bit about the technology use of technology. Um, how are the banks using that, and uh, can they improve in terms of the products that are out there? Maybe even the products should be more friendly to sustainability. So how do we deal with that? And uh, and I think there is a lot of scope uh, for that. Um, I don't know how far I've gone on this, but the other thing, as I mentioned, is communication. Uh, in this, I think the Central Bank of Seashells has done very well, I, and I mean communication with the general public. But I think a lot more needs to be done. Um, the, the public needs to know uh, that the Central Bank is on its side, or rather it's in, its, it's in the public's corner, and actually the reason that it does particular things, not just in the decision on interest rates and things like that, but all decisions um, are for the benefit of the population. Um, finally, of course, working with uh, the government uh, officials and uh, really being the, the advisor to government and in this, I guess I would say that uh, I do understand central bankers. We don't. Uh, it's say that if you have a room full of central bankers, they'll be talking about their ministers of finance. And you have a room full of ministers of finance, they'll be talking about their governors. You know? And if you put them together, they'll talk about the weather. You know? So, well, I don't know. But I think the point here is that the... Central banks tend to be more attuned to risks, and uh, ministries, governments, etc., are more into momentum. You know, so in some sense, we do need to work with the ministers or the government in general and explain to them what are the risks of certain uh, certain uh, decisions or should we say certain trends, etc., um, and thereby, because at the end of the day, all of us have the same objective, which is uh, uh, the betterment of our people. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Jiroge. So my takeaway from that response is that, first and foremost, ensure robust foundation through macro stability. And then this will help you focus on the challenges ahead, like you mentioned, climate change. And few points, again, to just pick out was through communication, which you continue to build on, through um, collaboration, not only with the private sector, but also with the public sector, the government ministers. Okay, thank you very much for that. First Deputy Governor, your presentation set the scene on what could be expected in the years to come for the central bank. With intensifying geopolitical tensions and geoeconomic fragmentation that we're increasingly seeing, could we expect central banking to become more challenging, particularly for developing economies such as ourselves? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ragvi, for this question. I mean, the, the, the obvious answer to that question is yes. Um, you see the, the central bank operate in an increasingly complex uh, environment. And all the indicators, the, it suggests that uh, um, in the future, such level of complexity is not to become easier. It's going to become more complex. One of the challenges that uh, central bank face is uh, for us to understand the innovation that is happening in the financial sector. So um, 
we need to understand whatever is coming up um, such that it does not compromise our mandate. So we ensure we are on top of whatever development is happening, be it innovation, whatever development. If I can uh, take, for example, uh, virtual assets, for example, um, virtual asset has significantly changed the way financial transaction, the character characteristics of financial transaction has changed significantly with the introduction of virtual asset. So what do we do as regulator? We need to understand what it means, how we impact our mandate, if any, so to, to ensure we are on top of what's going on out there. So um, um, one, give, given that developing central bank in terms of capacity, we are limited, limited resources. So one thing that we tend to do is like uh, uh, Dr. Jorogi has, has uh, uh, mentioned earlier is to learn from our peers. So being developing central bank, one thing we could do, we could learn from each other and understand whatever innovation development is happening um, in the financial sector, central bank environment and all that. But uh, having said that, uh, we know the world is dynamic. Um, as soon as, let's say, you are trying to understand, for example, virtual asset, what it means, suddenly you hear of other things that are coming along. Now we're hearing about AI, artificial intelligence. So the question is, would that impact our activity at the central bank? Can it have implication on the mandates that the way we deliver on our mandate? So, uh, I mean, it remains to be, see, to be seen. So being small, being developing uh, capacity, we always tend to be lagging behind. So this would, in my view, is one of the main challenges being faced by developing central bank, including Central Bank of Seychelles. Thank you. Thank you, First Deputy Governor. So again, just to probably recap, from what I'm hearing is that we need to do our work and try to stay ahead of the curve, improving our understanding, not only through the literature that is at our fingertips today, but also from learning from each other through other central banks and our other colleagues. Um, and then what I also heard was the, the W's. What do you do? How do you go about doing it? Why and how would it impact the bank? So I think we need to do a bit more reading <laughs> to try and keep abreast of what's happening globally. So members of the audience, you are now kindly invited to ask questions, seek clarifications, or present your views on the subject matter. We would be most grateful if you could kindly introduce yourself before your intervention for the benefit of our speakers. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, presenter, and thank you, uh, members of the panel. And uh, we are most grateful for the two presenters to have uh, so uh, eloquently outlined the position of central banks. Looking into the uh, crystal ball, I think both of them touched on climate change and uh, technology um, to predict what challenges the central banks are, uh, may have. But I want to ask about geopolitical shifts, in particular in relation to uh, developments like BRICS. How do you see geopolitical shifts affecting monetary systems uh, across the world, uh, especially in uh, smaller nations that are very, very dependent on uh, the stability of, uh, mo of international monetary systems? Do you see uh, BRICS as a challenge to the uh, predominance of the U.S. dollar in uh, monetary systems, and uh, do you see other geopolitical uh, impacts that uh, may uh, be of consequence to us? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And yes, uh, it's a tough question, so I hope you'll be lenient on the marking, you know, so. And, uh, I, I think the, you're absolutely right. The, the geopolitical sort of landscape is uh, not favorable to any of us, and it's actually quite uncertain. 
And uh, that uncertainty is feeding into a lot of the things we are doing, we as countries, etc. And uh, in, in some sense, we do need to reduce the uncertainty. But the, f the, the things that are emerging, uh, the BRICS, is an attempt to deal with some of those uncertainties that were there before. And uh, the BRICS is really, I mean, technically is uh, trying to create a sort of a, a cluster of countries that can support each other um, in a case of need through, let's say, financing, etc. The the point though is that uh, if the if the country and these are the emerging markets for the most part, it's the, the BRICS are, you know, the larger emerging markets, the China, etc., Brazil, um, we, we know them. But I, I think the point in all this is it can only go so far, you know, the, the BRIC sort of uh, idea. Why? Because what is happening now, the BRICs are always on the same side of the shock. So for the systems and international systems as well to work, you do need to have some sort of uh, uh, self-insurance. That is, uh, you, when one country is hit by a shock, the other country provides some support, either financing, etc. It cannot be that all the countries, um, as is happening now, are on the same side. And uh, so it doesn't work well if the shocks are very much um, sort of similar for these countries. But in terms of uh, the political side of it, obviously it's a, it's a very strong statement, right, on the BRICS. And I'll leave the politics. I won't discuss the politics. You're much more an expert in this than I am on the politics. Okay, so the point is clear, but I want to make a second point, which is there are the other trends that are out there. You talked about the dominance of the US dollar, which has become problematic for a lot of us. Um, and uh, it's not just the US dollar itself, it's actually having one market that is really dominant. And I'm talking of, let's say, the capital markets. We all go to, uh, you know, to one Eurobond market, etc., to borrow, um, and that is driven by the same trends, for that matter. So I think the issue here is this sort of uh, coming together and uh, of uh, the various, let's say, uh, into one pool. I think we need to, even as we have the BRICS experiment, etc., we need to think of other ways of uh, minimizing that sort of central tendency of this. Um, or rather that sort of having only one point, um, meaning the, 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 the most dominant market or for that matter the most dominant currencies. I know there's a lot of discussion of having settlements outside the U.S. Uh, market or U.S. dollar market, but that will take time to break. I mean, the, the, it's been, the U.S. dollar has been around, dominant for so long, also because of the political strength of, uh, of uh, the issue, in this case, the US. So in a nutshell, I think we, we are doing the right thing in pushing these other, uh, let's say, developments, the BRICS. But I don't think that this will be the definitive solution for our problems. Um, and what's more is the outcomes of this will take time to be felt. So I think we, uh, we cannot wait. We need to have solutions that are much more um, impactful in terms of time, et cetera. So I will stop there, but uh, maybe DG, you have uh, an answer to this. Okay, thank, you. thank you, doctor. Anyway, for me, um, the way I look at it, I mean, if um, countries like economies across the globe they get together to group. I mean, we, the, the, obvious, the first obvious question is what, could bene what benefit this can have to the world. My thinking would be one would be trade. I mean, if, we can if the grouping of these countries can um, lead to benefit to the rest of the world in terms of trade, I think it's, it's something positive. And also by trade, it can also help to influence stability in prices. I mean, if you can have region, currently you have um, groups of the, for example, US is a powerful economy. 
if in terms of diversify, diversification, you have one part of the world that's powerful, then let's say you are to have another group of the world that's powerful c compared to the American economy. So you can say it's be it benefits the global trade from that perspective. And uh, But uh, having said that, um, Doctor has mentioned about it as well, uncertainty. You know, these regions, you, you need to look deeper into it. I mean, in terms of the political situation across the countries that's forming this grouping, would it be more um, uh, stability from an economic perspective? As you know, um, stability from an economic pers um, political perspective would sort of filter through to the economy. So being small like Seychelles, you know, um, we depend heavily on what is happening happening out there. So let's say we, you have a region, let's say the, a, a new grouping, we'll call the BRICS. We're trading more with the BRICS because it brings additional new benefit. And suddenly, such new block is not really stable. So there's implication for us um, as a small um, economy as well. So um, from my perspective, this is how I, I, I look at it. Um, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Njoroge and uh, the governor, and of course the moderator. I wanted to ask uh, of the panel about climate change, the squeezing of finance generally around the world, and the role of the central bank. Um, as you know, climate change is real, and in Seychelles, in the last three days alone, we have really felt the impact, the rising tides in many parts of Mahe. Um, it's risen at levels that we haven't seen in the last 50 years. And it's damaging roads, it's damaging infrastructure. It's real. So we are, without doubt, being affected right now. So what would the central bank be able to do to leverage finance around the world from financial institutions, particularly given the fact that uh, finance itself around the world is getting more expensive and the traditional sources of finance for countries like Seychelles, which would be the bilaterals or the multilaterals, is more and more difficult. And even now with COP28, uh, I'm not so sure reading the text of what's coming out, what may be available for Seychelles, because they seem to focus on what they call the least developed countries, and they tend to forget that small ones can be vulnerable as well. So what can the central bank do, really, either alone or with other central banks, to really bring the matter home money will be required by small countries like Seychelles, and we need money urgently, but also money that is not too expensive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. The, this is indeed the problem of today. Um, where do we get financing to deal with the, or to actually put in place the solutions that we may have, um, and time is of the essence. So that's the question. But I think uh, in some sense here, yeah, we should first uh, applaud the actions of uh, um, the authorities in Seychelles precisely on this point. Um, it is true the, the tides and uh, sea levels are rising, but uh, if you look at what you've done over the last, uh, let's say, even three, five years, you know, there has been a lot of work in, uh, in, in this area. Uh, I'll only point to one aspect, but the other things. I mean, for instance, the work you've done to, um, to get the financing from the IMF's uh, Resilience and Su Sustainability Trust. And uh, that was a new trust facility that was uh, created um, a year ago, really, and, uh, and really provides funding to countries so that they can take uh, climate-related actions. So really financing the issues that you mentioned. 
and uh, Seychelles was one of the was actually the second country in the region to benefit from this. There's uh, some amount, I believe it, according to my numbers here, uh, it's a significant amount, well, 57 million US dollars in the EFF and, uh, and uh, 46 million dollars in the RCF, which is this new facility, and the two were done together. And that will provide you with a bit of breathing space, you know, breathing room, as the other financing from other sources as you work to provide, uh, to deal with that, I mean, to, to get this. So I think you are ahead. Um, by the way, I should say that the first country in the region, Rwanda, has also, I mean, has done well in this and the focus on uh, taking those climate actions. Then yourselves, the other country I'd want to mention is Barbados, um, that you've, you have been working with them in particular ways, you know, as a, a similar countries, as it were. Kenya has also done the same, meaning has also gotten support from this, but I think the question is more specific to small island economies in this regard. So that's one thing. Uh, to be clear, those actions also have, um, there, there are things that the central bank needs to do with the commercial banks, the financial sector. And these relate to, for instance, guidelines, et cetera, on uh, climate change, you know, uh, meaning financing of products so that they are, or financing of uh, projects in particular ways so that they are actually um, supportive of climate action and do not detract. Now, it's true here you don't have, uh, let's say, coal plants and things like, the, like that, but when you build a seawall, I mean, are you building it uh, to the point of, uh, you know, that that seawall will be, pro will protect even in, you know, sort of, uh, one in a thousand sort of year um, tides or whatever the, the ratio is. So I think there are those considerations that need to be, that, this, that the central bank will need to work with the, uh, with the banks so that those conditions are, um, they apply and indeed are, 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 yeah, they, they are applied. But I want to also mention a couple of other things. I think the in the near term, we have this financing, but in the, in, the, in the medium term, the central bank will need to work with, obviously, the Minister of Finance and other actors uh, to differentiate themselves as seashells so that the country can differentiate itself. What do I mean by this? So that the other financing can, I mean, at the end of the day, financing uh, needs to, in order to finance a particular institution or project, et cetera, one does look at the risk, the country risk in the place. So in effect, we need to, the, there needs to be action that actually ensures that our risk profile is reduced and thereby redu differentiate ourselves from other countries that may be of high risk. If you look at our, any countries in the, in our region, the, the, uh, the, the, the credit premium is quite high. You know, the credit risk premium is quite high. And if that can be reduced, and it will also lead to attracting of investors and uh, other uh, people that uh, would be IFIs, et cetera. The third area, I think, of, is working with particular IFIs. And in this, the World Bank is key. Um, You've also been working with them in particular ways for the uh, financing through the DPO. There's a development uh, program operation that is there. Uh, but I think also working with the private sector through the IFC um, is something that will be recommended so that the projects are really ready and they are now tuned to this climate risk thing. The central bank will have to be necessarily be part of this. It, is, it has to come to the table because in some sense it is an advisor to government, but also it, of the assurance it needs to provide in terms of uh, macro stability on their side. So I see um, working in collaboration. I see them working in collaboration with all the other actors in government uh, for this common objective. And as we say, if, uh, if you have a real problem, you better have everybody at the table you don't want to have uh, some players, you know, sitting at the bench and having fewer than 11 players on the field. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. If I can just add, I mean, one thing that uh, Seychelles we've been uh, leading um, in terms of financing, uh, I know we we one of the first countries to raise blue bond, green green bond. So um, I, I think that's one of the ways whereby we can go through um, uh, uh, raising funds in, um, in the international market through our development partners. I think this work, this one is a feasible option that it has work. I, I think there's scope there to to continue uh, on this journey. And uh, one thing though, at home with the commercial banks. We we have uh, banks in Seychelles that lend. So the question is, how can they domestically lend more towards so, sort of financing green projects? So I think there is area there for us to work domestically with our existing uh, banks to see how they can increase financing to all to these sort of projects. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor and First Deputy Governor. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, of course. I'm tempted to ask one more. <laughs> I, was, I saw in the news last night that one country is uh, proposing a totally virtual currency. Uh, I forget now which country. And it came to my mind that some uh, uh, oh, more than 40 years ago, and many people in our audience may not even have been born by then, uh, somebody in the old Seychelles College Hall delivered a lecture about uh, a pr a proposing a cashless society for Seychelles. And uh, uh, there has been a lot of talk recently about uh, reducing the uh, reliance on cash. And so I would just want to ask uh, the presenters if uh, what they say about uh, the uh, demise of uh, paper money, should we begin writing RIP? Uh, on the idea. Thank you. Okay. So can I take it? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. The, there's a lot of discussion today about uh, virtual currencies, as you mentioned. I'm not sure um, what the program was, but but I think I want to distinguish two things. If, if you are looking at cash, the paper money as such, versus other digital money, uh, that I think is one way of looking at it. And I think there has been a lot of advancement on the digital side. In Kenya, for instance, I mentioned that we have reduced, uh, we have increased our financial inclusion, um, or financial access. Uh, from to 84 percent, actually higher than that, but the last check was at 84 um, percent. And a lot of this has been on the back of mobile uh, transactions on the mobile phone. So yes, that is uh, not paper, therefore it is digital money, if you want to put it that way. And uh, we do transactions a bit like, uh, let's say, banks here will have the RTGS, it works, right? The, um, I don't know what it's called. The RTGS, is, you call it another name, I saw it, right? But anyway, so you have these electronic transfers, um, and uh, today in Kenya and other countries, uh, most of the transactions are taking place electronically from one part, retail transactions from uh, one person to the other on the phone, on the mobile phone. That is great. For many, uh, for many reasons, the ones you mentioned. But I think also there are new risks that this brings in, and we have largely mitigated them in particular ways. So that's one, and I think uh, it's one that should be encouraged. I, I really don't think there will ever come a time when we will say we are cashless, completely gone cashless. I, 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 we, I mean, at least in Kenya, the country I know the most, um, you'll still have pockets of uh, people that are doing transactions with cash. Um, and actually for myself, I, it's only the last few months that I've actually been doing some cash transactions. Um, I mean, for years I've gone without having to do cash transactions. So 
in a sense, it's very low in terms of the number of transactions I conduct um, as, as cash. So that I think we need to improve, uh, but I think it is there. It's a lesson that can be learned. There are lessons to be learned by everybody. Then within digital money, there's the so-called, uh, the other currencies, the, let's just call them the, the virtual currencies. Uh, and these are the virtual monies that the private sector is trying to put out, right? And, uh, and that, I think, is a question that is still out there. And I think a lot of it is, very, is linked to the virtual assets that uh, the first deputy governor mentioned. Maybe he will clarify a little more later. And, uh, and I think that one, the jury is still out, meaning what are the benefits, how, how do you minimize the risks, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of hype about... Um, that having this uh, virtual money uh, that this private sector issued will help um, accelerate the cross-border transactions and things like that. But I think uh, the jury is still out in terms of how the risks that this brings, uh, how they are being uh, dealt with. Uh, it's true there are two countries that uh, have announced that they'll go you know, 100% that in that direction. Um, and maybe it also is aligned to shutting down their central banks. I don't know, you know, but I'll leave that for others to discuss. Then there's the other point of even with uh, in the space of virtual money, uh, there is the so-called central bank digital currencies. And in a sense, this is... Uh, relates to having an account at the central bank. Today and now, you only have commercial banks and the government. They're the only ones that, for the most part, uh, have accounts in the central bank. Now, you can imagine having 100,000 accounts at the central bank. Every person in the country has a, an account in the central bank, and then you give them you know, some money, and they can transact, and all the transactions are taking place in the central bank. Um, so the central bank becomes like a big commercial, well, used lightly, um, retail bank. And there are, there, are, there are people that are working on this. Um, the question we have asked is, what is the benefit of this? What solution are you, are you solving in terms of the payments? Are you making it easier for the people, or are you just doing something because you can do it? Um, and here is where there's a lot of discussion in our space. I'm talking of central banking space. Um, and uh, a lot of countries have been involved in this as, let's say, testing the waters, piloting. Technically, it's not a problem. Technically, it's easy. But the issue is, why do you want to do it? Um, I mean, and uh, does the population benefit from it? So in our case in Kenya, what we did is we actually um, asked this question, we threw this question to the population. Also, we did our own internal work and asked the population, so um, what do you think about this? Is it something that we think, you think is beneficial? And in the end, the answer was along the lines that uh, it's not our immediate priority. Um, we will get to it, but uh, when at this moment, we have more pressing priorities. So I think those are the sort of uh, distinctions that one needs to think through and uh, in the end also asking why is it that uh, we'll do that? It's a change, but uh, does it benefit the population? Does it benefit the country in particular ways? Even though technically it has been proved um, to be possible. I want to finish by making the point that this is an area where a lot of collaboration among central banks is going on and is needed. Because in some sense, it cannot be that everybody's doing the same study again and again and again. It, it, there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination and uh, you know, sort of exchange of lessons that is going on, and I think that is, that is really beneficial. I'll stop here. <coughs> Sorry. If, thank you for the question. If I can add, I mean, as part of the, the plan of the central bank is to go cash light, in the economy, I think it's it's a, a move that 
is being supported by also by the government. I mean, it's on the agenda of the government as well to reduce the use of cash. I mean, we all know there are benefits associated with going using less cash, for example, becoming more efficient, um, record keeping as well, which which helps uh, in the in the process. But uh, having said that, um, you, we we should take note of where Seychelles is. Um, I mean, it, it, it would be difficult to see a social without cash altogether, and for different reasons. One, for business continuity. Imagine um, you've, you've uh, locked from the rest of the world, no, no communication. How do you go about doing uh, economic transaction if all your transaction is being done digitally, digitally with no cash? I mean, it, it's, I, I'm sure it will be a nightmare. So having said that, it... it it's it's something that we should uh, take note of. Um, the plan is to to move uh, um, towards using less cash uh, in the economy. Um, if I can touch a bit on virtual asset, I'm virtual asset or digital currency. At the at the moment, at the central bank, it's something that we are it, 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 we just monitoring observing how it's gone, understanding what's happening out there, doing our research, reading to understand. Um, we, f we know at this point that it brings some risk with it, and we know that at the moment we do not have the capacity to manage such a risk. So um, currently it, it's something that we're monitoring to ensure uh, we understand, let's say, tomorrow. I mean, because this, it, it's happening out there. We may not like it, but it can come to our shore. So by the time it comes, we need to know how we manage it. So it's something that we are on the watch out. We need to, on, like I've mentioned before, we should always know what's happening out there to ensure whenever it hits the shore, uh, we're in a position to see how to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the wonderful questions. Thank you, Dr. Jeroge and First Deputy Governor for enlightening us on such pertinent topics. It was truly an honor for us to have witnessed both interventions from such distinguished central bankers. At this juncture, I will hand it over back to Jude to continue with the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Naidu, for um, expertly steering us through this interesting segment of the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation and for the, and for the fascinating discussion. It has been truly enlightening. At this juncture, we would like to express our sincere thanks to our guest speaker, Dr. Jeroge, who has uh, graciously joined us tonight and shared many insights through his intervention. To express uh, our gratitude, I now call upon the first Deputy Governor to present uh, Dr. Jeroge with a token of appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Jeroge and uh, First Deputy Governor. You may take your original seats for the remainder of our program. We will now move, we will now move on to the next item on the agenda for this evening, which will be the launching of the Central Bank's strategic plan for the period 2024 to 2028. For any organization, strategic planning is important as it provides a sense of direction and outlines measurable goals. Strategic planning is also a, a useful tool that guides day-to-day -day decisions and allows for the evaluation of progress and adjustments at, as it is implemented. The new strategic plan 2024 to 2028 will build onto the achievements of the preceding plans including the current one, which is being implemented since 2019 and is coming to an end. I will now invite you to view a short video that has been prepared to give an overview of the essence of the strategic plan, including the central themes, key strategic initiatives, and core values that will guide the work of the institution over the next five years.
pouvez aussi voir comment est l'organisation enfermée et même compliquée pendant beaucoup d'années. La Banque centrale il fait beaucoup pour créer sa dernière décennie pour rapprocher avec un acteur clé dans le secteur financier, un clé dans l'institution en bas son supervision, médias et public en général. En ici qui continue à évoluer et délivrer le son mandat, ça l'institution peut continuer à mettre ses efforts pour avancer les devants d'une plus transparent et communique d'un langage plus simple et clair. Malgré différents défis tels que la pandémie COVID-19, beaucoup n'ont accompli pendant sa dernière cinq ans. Pour bâtir le savoir de l'accomplissement qui amène l'hiver son 45 ans d'existence aujourd'hui, la Banque centrale y a un plaisir pour lancer son nouveau plan stratégique pour 2024 à 2028. C'est ce document qui pour guide son travail pour sa prochaine cinq ans pour assurer que la Banque centrale y continue à progresser face à bon développement qui pour continuellement arriver localement et à l'étranger et atteindre son bon objectif principal pour promouvoir la stabilité dans le prix et dans le système financier. Sa nouveau plan y résulte un processus consultatif de son performance aussi bien qu'il y ait analyse de bon différents facteurs dans son environnement interne et extérieur. Un exercice qui souligne un point fort, point faible, l'opportunité et les menaces qui est capable de faire face à Vic. Sa l'engagement, Bandis inclut son board, management et travailleurs, mais il aussi prend perspective dans différents acteurs dans le secteur financier et membre public en général. C'est un partenaire international, il aussi supporte la formulation de sa plan et partage de connaissances sur la façon qui est capable de l'implémenter d'une façon effective pour un meilleur résultat. Si ces plans stratégiques 2024 à 2028 pour dépendre de l'accomplissement 28 initiatives stratégiques qui posent un rôle clé de travail à la Banque centrale pour délivrer le bonne fonction. Ce qui est divisé en bas trois thèmes centrales, sa stabilité monétaire, stabilité financière et renforcement de capacité interne, accompagné par certains principes fondamentaux. Dans l'esprit de rendre compte et la transparence, nous prenons responsabilité pour de bonnes décisions et actions. L'inclusion et est nous valorise diversité et donne toutes les connaissances pour faire d'autres contributions. Nous croyons dans l'innovation et encourage la créativité et les nouvelles idées. Nous engageons pour un résultat. L'humilité est important à cause de nous pour écouter et apprendre avec les autres pour améliorer le côté nécessaire. L'intégrité est sa fondation lorsque nous bâtissons nos bons engagements. Nous croyons dans l'esprit de travailler ensemble pour atteindre nos bons objectifs. Respect est la clé pour cultiver la collaboration de nos institutions et avec nos bons partenaires. Démonstration de sa bonne valeur y va établir un cultif qui contribue pour mener plus de succès et aide la Banque centrale à bouger plus devant. Et la liste d'activités est clé dès les temps de qui ont pu implémenter au cours de sa prochaine 5 ans, en ligne avec sa 28 initiatives stratégiques, une des agents est préparée. Sa division et qui unit pour aussi développer d'autres plans d'action, une base annuelle pour assister à l'implémentation de priorités stratégiques qui ont été établies. Tout ça là pour grand ici veiller des prêts. Sa document, pas un qui pousse statique, évaluation pour bien faire le progrès et l'ajustement pour bien faire ce qui est nécessaire pour refléter la réalité. Dans l'esprit rendre compte et la transparence, la Banque centrale est aussi engagée pour rapport à l'implémentation de sa plan pour faire ainsi que tout le monde qui contribue envers son formulation et public en général est resté informé. Plan stratégique 2024 à 2028 avec thème et la Banque centrale progressive qui peut encourager la transformation économique a mis avec son vision pour contribuer avec croissance et développement inclusif Cécile, y a une visée vers inspire confiance dans l'institution pour lui capable de continuer à accomplir son bon objectif et tracer main vers son zibilé l'or. I shall now invite the second deputy governor of the Central Bank of Seychelles, uh, Ms. Jennifer Sullivan, to the stage. The second deputy governor has been instrumental in spearheading the strategic planning process from the start, and this evening she will present a token version of the CBS Strategic Plan 2024 to 2028 to two stakeholders of the Central Bank. We would like to invite the Vice President, Mr. Ahmed Afif, to receive the token on behalf of the government and the Chairman of the Seychelles Bankers Association, Mr. Philip Moustache, 
who receive same on behalf of the Seychelles Bankers Association. Grateful if the Vice President and uh, Mr. Mustache will remain on stage for a photo with the second Deputy Governor after the presentations. And now for a group photo, um, all three. Thank you, Vice President. Thank you, Vice President, Chairman of the Seychelles Bankers Association, and Second Deputy Governor. The CBS Strategic Plan 2024-2028 has already been published on the Central Bank of Seychelles website and can be accessed through the QR code which will be displayed on the screens outside the conference room. As our event is gradually coming to an end, we now have the pleasure of inviting uh, Professor William Mogara, a director of uh, the board of the Central Bank of Seychelles, to deliver the closing remarks. Your Excellency the Vice President Ahmed Afi and uh, the Deputy Designated Minister here present, the Speaker of the National Assembly, our Chief Guest Dr. Patrick Njoroge, the former Governor of Central Bank of Kenya, uh, First Deputy Governor, Second Deputy Governor, uh, Senior Colleagues in the Bank, all protocols duly observed. Allow me at this particular stage just to say three things. The first thing is to really appreciate Dr. Njoroge. You have left behind a number of assignments to come and grace this occasion. We really want to cherish with great delight the time that you have taken and even the simplicity with which you have shared, even coming from your heart what really you have gone through. And even listening to our own 45 years of history in this lovely country, we thank you so, so much. And thank you for being vulnerable, even talking about climate change. And it just does indicate how, as economists, you're being pushed to, into areas that you probably may be wondering how you can articulate them, and yet, they affect us directly and indirectly. Thank you, Dr. Njoroge. We really want to appreciate that time that you've had with us. First, Deputy Governor, thank you so much for articulating our 45 years of history. And as you are doing that in your humility, it reminded me of one Dr. Atday, or a person that I valued over the years, when he says the transformative change is like ocean tide. And when I look at the 45, and exactly what you're saying is very typical of the ocean tide, it can neither be controlled nor ignored. And I think you've done it pretty well. May God bless you, even as we launch into the deep. Allow me at this stage not to forget the tireless work, the hard work that the second deputy governor has done 
together with uh, quite a team, the team that uh, behind the scenes have been working to burn the midnight oil to make sure that this strategy is available. Dr. Patrick Joroge, we want to assure you that as we launch into the deep in implementing this strategy, we are aware that the way ahead will be turbulent. But we will do all we can to make sure that we go through it. Thank you for highlighting those uh, very specific key change drivers. They are key to us. We, can, we will not ignore them. They are very fundamental. And for us to make progress, it will be important that we bring them on board. We continue to reflect on them. We may not have the answers, but I think that is the essence of being a servant. The very fact that we depend on stakeholders around us here present who we believe have a rich repository of knowledge that we can learn from. And Seychelles is not an island on its own. We believe we are part and parcel of a global body where there is so much learning and we will develop that humility to continue the learning. Management, members of management here present and all the staff behind the scene, you've been working so hard. And allow me to take this opportunity to thank you. Jude, thank you so much. Uh, Madam Naido, thank you for articulating these issues and also providing a safe space for us to raise the questions. And this we begin is just a dress rehearsal for what lies ahead of us. We want to believe we are on the right track and there is so much for us to do. I think the best we will do is to join hands together for a collective uh, winning of this journey. Allow me as I close just to affirm our vision in the central bank. All of us here present today, I believe that we seek towards, towards, towards contributing to the inclusive growth and development of Seychelles. And the realization of this vision will require collective support and commitment of our key stakeholders. Indeed, we will not be able to do it alone. Thank you so much. And we want to take this opportunity to thank God for having been with us throughout this journey. May God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ogara. Before we conclude this evening, we have one more highlight. And for this, I call uh, First Deputy Governor to the stage once again. As highlighted during the evening, a critical part of the Central Bank's success and at the heart and soul of this in institution has been its dedicated staff. Tonight, we would like to pay tribute to eight long-serving employees with over 30 years of service. I would like to ask the colleagues who will be honored uh, to remain on stage after receiving their token of appreciation for a group photo at the end of the presentations. Please give a round of applause as, as we invite them to the stage. And the first person that I would like to call is Mr. Terry Adrien with 40 years of service. Thank you. Terry, remain on stage, please. Thank you. Um, uh, the second person will be Mrs. Levina Francoise with 37 years of service.
Next, uh, I would like to call uh, Miss uh, Shirley Mendez with 36 years of service. It seems Miss Mendez is not with us this evening. Um, uh, and I would like to call upon Miss uh, Erica Pote also to join us, who also has shared 36 years of service. So we can take a group photo with those that are present. Thank you, um, First Deputy Governor, um, uh, Mr. Adrienne, uh, Mrs. Francoise, and uh, Ms. Poutin. Another round of applause for them, please. The other four colleagues being honored uh, today, unfortunately, cannot be with us this evening. They are um, Ms. Donation Laporte, with 39 years of service. Mrs. Uh, Jeannette Payette with uh, 36 years of service, as well as uh, Miss Dorota Michel and Miss uh, Florette Awan, each with 32 years of service. Let us extend a warm congratulations to our long-serving colleagues, their unwavering commitment and dedication is uh, commendable and we wish them all the very best as they, as they continue to contribute to CBS's success and inspire the, young the younger generation of central bankers. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on this note, we have officially come to the end of our 40, 45th anniversary lecture. It was a pleasure to be your MC for this year's anniversary lecture. Thank you to all our guests who have graced us with your presence, as well as members of the public who have followed our event online. A very good evening to you all. Thank you.